Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Kelly Wenzel. I'm the president of Angie, co-president with Mike Shadroff. Um, also joining us are um, Kirsten Holt. Thank you, my trusty co-worker and calling me out <laughs> at New Jersey Audubon, as well as an Angie volunteer. And we've got our friend Hugh Carolla, also a support um, from Hackensack Riverkeeper, um, also on the board of Angie. Um, so we're so excited that you're here uh, with us today for our workshop, The Importance of Freshwater Ecosystems and How We Can Help Them as part of ANGIE's 36th Annual Conference. Um, as you know, we love to be in person. It's what we do. Um, but through generosity of um, PSEG, New Jersey Natural Gas, and an anonymous donor who just loves science and education, we are able to bring this to you absolutely free of charge which we are very excited about. Um, and we would also like to thank the Watershed Institute for sponsoring this particular workshop. Uh, the Watershed Institute is in Pennington, New Jersey. It's about a thousand acres of um, forests and wetlands, uh, meadows and farmland with more than 10 miles of hiking trails. So we encourage you to check them out and I will put their website um, in the chat um, momentarily. Um, all of our sessions are being recorded and the chats are being collected. And um, also in our chat, um, you will find our YouTube channel. So be sure to subscribe to that and you'll be able to see all the sessions from this conference, as well as chat notes, um, pertinent information that we pull out from those. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Um, please keep yourself on mute um, unless um, Elena, our, our speaker, asked people to come off for some reason. Um, questions or comments can go right in the chat. That would be excellent. Um, and we will definitely have time for some live interaction um, at the end, no doubt. Um, so we're going to get started with uh, the importance of freshwater ecosystems and how to help them. This workshop will discuss the importance of freshwater eco ecosystems. Um, how the key species contribute to the well being of these habitats, and how we can help our local rivers and ponds sustain for the future. And our presenter today is Elena Villanueva. And um, I will let you take it away, Elena. Okay, thank you, Kelly. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah. So I'm going to share the screen. So uh, I'm going to talk about freshwater ecosystems and how we can protect them. I decided to talk about this because freshwater ecosystems are my favorite type of ecosystems because they're so beautiful and are so full of life. I wanted to share this quote. A river is a magic thing, a magic moving, living part of the earth itself by Laura Gilping. And here we have a river in Saddle River Park in Paramos if you guys have the chance to visit. So freshwater ecosystems. When we're talking about freshwater ecosystems, we're talking about a wide range of water bodies. This can be either river, ponds, streams, or lakes. And freshwater is different from salt water in different ways. One of the ways is that freshwater does not become so foul so rapidly compared to salt water. And you know, in salt water in the ocean, we have a greater variety of animals and greater quantity as well. But in freshwater, we have insect larvae. So that makes it very different from the ocean. And it also accounts for 3% of our water in our planet. So we really need to take care of our ecosystems because we only have a short amount of fresh water in our planet. So we need to protect it. So freshwater ecosystems are important because of different reasons. One of them is that they are the key foundation for our country's well-being. Thanks to this type of ecosystems, we have clean drinking water, we have agriculture, uh, they support our domestic needs in our home, industrial requirements as well. So everything that we have for a well-functioning society is thanks to them. They're also the home of millions of species, like the heron that you see here. But unfortunately, they face many threats, 
Some of these are plastic pollution, pesticide runoff from the agriculture that washes into the wetlands, and other threats like urban runoff and acid rain because of climate change. So I think that the first step towards freshwater and river conservation is to connect with these ecosystems firsthand. So go and connect with the pond, your local river, because by connecting with it, you start to care more and take care of it. And it's also important to learn about the native species of the freshwater ecosystems and the keystone species. So before I go on, I wanted to ask everyone here, so what is a keystone species? And you guys can put your answer in the chat. So these are some of the options. A, a species that is in danger. B, a species that is essential to its ecosystem. B, a, C, a species that is not native of that place. Or D, a species that has been recently introduced to the ecosystem. Okay. So. so it looks like we're getting a lot of bees. A lot of bees? Oh, Elena. that's nice. <laughs> yeah. Not only, uh, is there other letters too, or? Um, all bees from this group. All bees, oh, so you guys, you guys all are correct. Oh, we have a lot of smart people here. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, you guys were right, yeah. A species that is essential to its ecosystem because of the environmental service that it provides. Okay. So I'm gonna talk about some of the freshwater keystone species that we have here in New Jersey. One of them is the dragonflies. They are very, they are quite ancient animals. Some archeologists have actually found dragonfly wings on limestone that dates back to 300 million years ago. So they have been here since a really long time. They also belong to the aerial and aquatic worlds. So they have their eggs in the water and then they become the full dragonfly and then live in the air. They're also known as the kings of adaptation because through their life, they adapt to many different things. First, they have the metamorphosis period and they also adapt to the temperature. So they change color. If, if it's very hot, they will change into a lighter color to cool themselves. Or if it's very cold, they will, like this red dragonfly will change into a more brownish red to absorb the heat and, and be warm. So that, that's pretty cool. And they're also beneficial insects, you know, they're keystone species because just one dragonfly can eat up to 1,000 mosquitoes and they eat other animal insects too, like ticks and flies. So they help the population down and so we can have um, healthier rivers as well. Okay, the next animal we have here are frogs. So they are unique creatures. They also have the metamorphosis period like the dragonflies and they adapt by changing color and blending to their environment. That way they can protect themselves from predators. They also help their ecosystem by eating uh, mosquitoes and flies. And as when they are tadpoles, they also help the water quality. So as a tadpole, they would eat the, the algae that is on the top of the pond and this helps the, the water not stagnate, so it helps the water quality as well. And in New Jersey, we have 17 different species. So one of them is this one, the green frog. But we also have other frogs like the gray frog and this one. This is the tree frog. I took this picture in Cloister, so you guys can, can see some of this in, in the Cloister Nature Center. And you can see how she blends into the tree. So it's the same color. So just be careful if you go around the forest so you don't step on her because she looks like the tree as well. And we also have um, the American beaver. And um, 
So the ones we have here are different from the European weavers. The ones we have here are more much smaller. And the ones in Europe have more um, like a lighter color, more like dark blonde. And they are larger as well, the European weavers. And they help the freshwater ecosystem in many different ways. So one of them is that they create dams. And they do this by chewing around a tree. And then they take the tree trunk once they have it and carry it through the water. As you can see here, he has some, some uh, sticks and other stuff. And then once they have it in the position they want, they put mud and leaves to make the dam. And this helps the water quality of the river. And by creating dams, they also create other wetlands, like new ponds, which means uh, increased biodiversity as well. They're also very committed. They made for life. So I think that's very admirable, right? And they also work through the night. They're really workaholics. And uh, like a fun fact is that some scientists say that they even eat their own poop because they don't they don't want to take a lunch break. <laughs> so they, they will eat it to be more productive, to increase their productivity. But the good thing is that they are vegetarian, so it's not as disgusting as if they were um, meat lovers. <laughs> and uh, Native American tribes consider them protectors of the land. Some of the tribes, like the Cherokees, they sing to the beavers and, and consider them the protectors of the land. And I think we should also adopt the wisdom from other cultures and recognize them in what they do for us. And in New Jersey, we have some of them in Camden, New Jersey, so that's south from here. But here in uh, North Jersey, there's some in Bergen County. I actually saw one in the Demarest Brook. Uh, so you can go to Demarest Nature Center and see some of them. I saw one during the summer, so that's when they're more, more active. And this is the beaver dam, so you guys can see how it looks like. And this is an activity that you can do with your students or the kids in your family, which is a build a dam activity. And it's pretty easy, you just need sticks, clay, rocks, a plastic dish and water. And you just make this dam by putting the water dish and I'm just creating the dam by with the clay and the sticks. And that way the kids can learn something about beavers and, and the freshwater ecosystems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next, we have the American eel. So usually people, when they hear about eels, they think of the electric one. But this one doesn't live in New Jersey. She's more, uh, she lives more in the tropical waters. But the one we have here is the American one. And she's born in the sea and grows up in the Hudson River. And she's very pretty, as you can see, it's a, it's a nice fish. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, let me go back. So this is the life cycle of the American eel. So first, she's born in the sea. A uh, single female will lay 20 million to 30 million eggs. Then she becomes a larva and grows fins. Then once she goes to the river, she becomes a young eel, then changes color into a yellow one. And then at the end of her life, she becomes a silver eel and then returns back to the sea to, to begin this cycle. Okay. And here we have, um, so I, I really love the American eel because she's a role model. She's a world traveler and she helps her environment. So she travels from here, from the North Atlantic Ocean, the Sargasso Sea. And she goes towards the New Jersey rivers that we have over here and then returns. And she's also a keystone species because she helps in different ways. One of them is that she's an important part of the 
the food chain. So without her, the balance would be lost. She also helps the water quality by eating the seaweed and the algae. And um, she's a bioindicator species. And this means that if you see her in the river, it means that that river is healthy. So this helps scientists know which, ri which rivers are healthy and if uh, to cre recreate that in other rivers. So she helps scientists collect data and, and learn more about how we can help the rivers. And so I have another fun question for you guys. So what do you think an American eel is? So she eats all of this except, and here are so, some options. <laughs> We're getting a lot of C's from this group. Uh huh. C, 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 all C's. All C's? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh my God. Yeah, so everyone is correct. Yeah, everyone gets A. plus. <laughs> yeah, so the correct answer is C. An eel does not eat catfish because they are too big for eels. And actually, the catfish eats eels. So that's interesting. Yeah, this probably is like a really big fish. You probably have digestion problems if you eat all this, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to talk about uh, the river conservation projects that we have in New York and New Jersey. And here is a map of our major rivers. So here is the Hudson River that divides New York City and New Jersey. We have the Hackensack, the Passaic, and other smaller ones like Ramapo and Saro. And they all begin from the Atlantic Ocean. So they all start here and then they go um, to their place. Mm -hmm. So these are some projects of the Hudson River Foundation. So some of the things that I want to do is to restore native fish. They want to restore the eels uh, because they are in danger and other native fish too, like sea bass and barracuda. They do research to document wildlife population. So they check how are the numbers in different species, like the herons and other native species. And they also monitor the water quality, which is an important part as well. Next, we have the Hackensack River Keeper. So they also have uh, different projects. They do river cleanups once a month. So you can volunteer as well to help them uh, each month. They are also the founders of the coalition to ban oil trains. So this means that some trains have a toxic oil. So if this oil is not um, controlled, it can leak and go into the wetlands which can damage um, everything there. So what they do is they want to ban these oil trains and also are asking for the trains to be properly maintained. So these accidents do not happen and I hope they, they never will. So that's good that they found this. And they also educate the, the public with workshops and uh, guided walks as well. And we also have the Passaic River Coalition. They also want to restore um, wildlife species. So they want to plant native plants or animals. I mean, plants and take care of the animals. Um, they do water quality management and flood as well. Because this area tends to be, is prone to flood. So they want to make sure it doesn't, the surrounding areas do not flood. This one. Then I wanted to share this poem of the river of Pasaic. It's called the Song of Pasaic and it was written back in 1890 by John McNabb. And I think it's cool to learn about our local history because we, we imagine how was life back then for the people that live in our towns. So I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so I'll read some of the uh, little sample. Um, the river runs, and none shall know 
how long the water may flow. We read the record of the past, while time withholds the future cast. And in the rise, the light and glow of brand old rivers in their flow. From distant hills, through dales and lea, the fair Pasaic seeks the sea. An Indian name which signifies that beaut and fruitful lies between the sea and mountain valley, this and mountain source, the valley where the waters course. Okay. And if you want to read the whole thing, you can just uh, look for the title. And the Fourth Rivers Trust. So uh, I did my master in Scotland. And while I was there, I collaborated with the Fourth Rivers Trust, which is a, an organization that focuses on rivers. And some of the projects that they do is that they train out they train volunteers to carry out river management. So this means that they train the volunteers to monitor the native species of the river, how to clean the river, treat the water, and other skills that you need for river management. They, so I think we should learn this from Scotland and maybe offer in here in New Jersey how to train volunteers to help these skills. So that way we can involve all the community, not just uh, the people that are like environmental focused. And they also monitor native species and they do outdoor workshops for the public. So I think this is a, a good tool to do outdoor education because that way people can connect with nature and are, are more involved you know, in conservation and in taking care of our planet. So we went to uh, teach some of the middle school kids in Scotland. And these are some of the, the activities that we did with them. And you guys can do it as well with your students and your kids in your family. So the activities, uh, draw how you would like your local river streams or ponds to look like. So this student here in seventh grade, so he drew like a nice river with a lot of wildlife. So he put no trash. So people put the trash there and not in the river. He put signs that said respect animals, so not later. And this student in the eighth grade, so she drew a nice healthy tree, clean water as well, and also recreational activities. So our rivers are clean enough for us to enjoy them and do recreational activities. So this is a nice fun exercise that you guys can do as well. Okay. And here are some, some ideas of how to help freshwater ecosystems. So save water, so do not use pesticide. You can try to see if you can find organic solutions for mosquitoes. And there's one brand I recommend, The Honest Company. They have shampoos and home products that are more plant-based and organic. You can participate in river cleanups, donate to freshwater organizations. It can be the ones I, I mentioned or other ones that are local to your area. And report any pollution that you see in your local river. And also uh, keep learning. That's an important one. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my contact info, this is my email and my blog, if you guys uh, want to write it down. So I write about environmental topics as well. Okay. Uh, and then I'll put it in the chat, I don't know, uh, later on. And then I wanted to ask people um, for a final activity. So if they want to write a wish for our planet, so something that you wish, it can be either local or global, uh, whatever you want. And I want to do this activity because I think that every action starts with a wish, with an intention to do something, to change. Uh, mine, I wrote that I wish that there were more green areas and wetlands in every country. And yeah, I wanted to hear your response. You guys were in the chat. OK. 
Okay, so yeah, take a minute to um, think and uh, write your wish for the planet in the chat, uh, like Elena has said. And um, yeah, we'll just take a few moments to do that. Rachel wishes for a proper balance between man and nature. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. We have a couple responses in Espanol. If anybody is available to translate, just let me okay. know. Yeah, I can, I know Spanish, so uh, maybe, if, I don't know how to read them. Hold on. Can you see the chat, Elena? Um, maybe I need to stop sharing, right? Or hold on. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so Clara wishes for clean water for all, green parks and forests where we can peacefully walk. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Let me see. Let me just. Anna wishes for no more trash in the planets. Mary Ann wishes there will be freshwater resources for the youth of today. Jay Bink wishes for uh, everyone had access to clean drinking water, that all freshwater ecosystems are swimmable and fishable. Angelica wishes we can maintain species diversity. Oh, Jeff nice. Hoagland is wishing working for a more intimate and respectful relationship between all people and their, their environment. Santana wishes for more respect for the animals. Uh, Svan Friedur, I'm um, sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, wishes that we could redesign our urban systems to function as productive ecosystems that cooperate with the natural ones. Ben wishes for a better understanding of our world and all the individual parts that make it. Um, we have a lot of really great wishes here for you, Elena, and for the mm -hmm. world. That's good. Um, it's really nice. So everybody, if you can take a moment and read that chat, I don't have to read every single one of them, but they're all really nice. Yeah. And we'll, we'll certainly download those for you too. <laughs> and I totally wish, I wish COVID would go away too, and that we could re yeah. <laughs> reunite in addressing global climate crisis. That one's. Uh, we're on our way. Yes, we're getting there. Um, yeah. So these are all wonderful um, wishes. And I think to uh, Elena's uh, point, you know, if we all stay focused and, um, you know, keep what we're, what we're studying in, in that laser focus that we'll, we'll all get there. It'll just take time and teamwork. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So Kirsten, were there a few questions in the chat that you. Yes, there were a few questions. Um, but first um, Elena, could you tell us a little bit more about your work and your your history and how you got to the point you're at today? Okay, sure. So uh, first, I well, I got my bachelor in Ramapo College, and then I went over to Scotland, and then I studied uh, environmental education there. And then, uh, so I met the people from the Four Rivers Trust that I talked about, and they have they have many projects about river conservation and. Yeah, and also the, the rivers that we have here in New Jersey, I love the hot sun. And so I, I, I really like freshwater ecosystems. So um, so I wanted to keep uh, researching more in that and maybe make that more my specialty, maybe eventually, yeah. <laughs> Great, so um, we have a question from Kelly, uh, her question is, how is the management of fresh freshwater ecosystems in Scotland different than in the United States? And what could the US be doing better comparatively? Oh. So I think they uh, involve more the community. So here, for example, you have to, like even to be a volunteer, right? You have to apply and volunteer, obviously it's like a, they're also competitive jobs, right? To be a volunteer is uh, an important one. But there, I think they're more um, kind of casual with that. So they they accept, I guess, everyone and they just, they train people to have their skills so they can, so the community is involved, you know? I think that's good, yeah. 
Um, Bridget asks, what is the single most important thing each of us can do to protect freshwater ecosystems? Um, let me think. Well, I think to keep learning about it, about them, and also to help with the river cleanups. Yeah, you can be a volunteer with that and, and clean your local rivers as well. And Angie is a great resource for that. We have lots of people who run cleanups in this group. Um, so Spawn Frieder asks, what are good activities to get children and young people engaged with learning about freshwater ecosystems? Oh, I actually have had a book that I wanted to recommend. Let me show you. Perfect. So this one, uh, I don't know if you guys can see. So it's a seashore, but there's another one from the same company that is about rivers. I don't know if you can see it. Yep. Uh, Habitat Explorer, and then the author is Nick Baker. And then it has some activities here that you can do with your students. So this is a nice resource. Uh, let me, I'll put it in the chat, right? I think I, um, I think I got it, Elena. Habitat yeah. Explorer. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have a, another question from Angelica, and her question is, are detergents and laundry softeners a major threat to the rivers? Um, I think it's better to change to more organic ones, because usually, like when we shower, all the things go, like maybe go to the ocean or the rivers. So maybe change to more organic so solutions, like organic soaps or shampoos. I think it's a better option here. Um, and then in the beginning of the presentation, we had a question and I, I can scroll back up to who asked, oh, Santana asked it. Um, and it was, how do we know if our rivers are healthy? Oh, okay, so I guess with the freshwater species, the keystone ones, uh, like the eels and dragonflies. So if you see them, that's a good signal. And also, well, if you don't see any pollution and if you see a lot of life and fish, and the, the local plants too, if there's like a lot of plants nearby, that's a good sign as well. Great. Okay, if we have any other questions, just put it in that chat. We can relay it to Elena. So Mary Ann asks, what are your concerns about the impact of microplastics on freshwater quality for humans and for wildlife? Um, yeah, I think that's a, like a worry, like a really bad topic, right? So there's actually a project, it's called, I think, the Nurdal Hunt. Uh, I mean, I'll type it in the, in the chat. I think this is Nurdal Hunt. So it's also about the ocean too. They they clean up the microplastics in the ocean, and then you send your data to uh, online for the people in that project. So for if you go to the Jersey Shore and you see microplastics there, you can see oh I'm in this area by the Jersey Shore. So just uh, search Neural Hunt project, and they're working on microplastics actually. Yeah. Okay, so I got another question. This is a, a cool one. Um, are there any ways that young people can see into freshwater ecosystems safely through snorkeling or videos, or are there any groups in New Jersey doing this? Um, well, there's uh, the ones that I talked about. So the Hackensack, uh, River Keeper, that's a good one. And there's other local ones. Uh, yeah, like the Hudson River Foundation, there's even other ones that are not essentially river ones, like Tinnick Creek Conservancy or New Jersey Audubon, they also take care of rivers as well. And I think, um, I think there's a stream, live stream set up through Essex County Environmental Center. Um, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it's through there where they actually have like a wildlife cam in a river or a river tank where you can actually see what's going on underwater. Could be. If I could jump in real quick. This is Huey. Sure, Huey. 
Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I heard you, someone asking about, was it snorkeling or, or diving in freshwaters in New Jersey? Yes. That would be a really cool thing. Um, the problem is, is that almost every lake in New Jersey uh, is a human constructed body of water. Uh, many of them were peat bogs and other wetlands that were dammed and then became lakes. And so basically they're very turbid. Their they're visibility underwater is quite terrible. Uh, and many you know, rivers like the Hackensack, the Passaic, even when you're up above <clears throat> the tidal zone um, are in many areas quite turbid or, or very shallow. Um, I grew up in a town that had eight lakes and every one of them was wonderful and you could swim in them all and eat the fish from them, but you couldn't see but three feet. <laughs> you know, down for the most part. Um, in places where, you know, the lakes and are, are essentially natural, you'll have much, much more visibility. Uh, like in upstate New York or in New England, I was always amazed to see how clear one can see through the water, like 30 feet down. It's, I was very jealous of that sort of thing. Um, and just a real quick thing, sometimes, you know, some of the worst types of pollution are the things you can't see. Um, like I'm always when I'm doing a tour on our boats, whatever I'm, and I've got kids. We're walking down the gangway, and they go, "Ew, the water looks dirty." I'm like, "Well, yeah, it's muddy, but mud is okay, you know." And then they have to explain between clean and clear. So, yeah, I always found that whatever, wherever the kids are at, whatever age of your students you're dealing with, there's always a there's always a fairly easy hook or a very fairly easy way to uh, to reach them and help draw out from them what they're looking for, what they want to see, and to, you know, really find those teachable moments and just go with them. And, uh, and water is just, you know, like the poems clearly and beautifully showed, um, is definitely such a wonderful way to, to get started with kids of all ages, because I've had older people go, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and besides Elena, you're a fellow, you're a fellow Rampo Roadrunner, so Oh, you went there too? Oh, or? Yeah, a million years ago. But. Okay. <laughs> That's nice. Um, Kirsten, I just want to add to that one too. I, I'm not a, a scuba diver. I have done snorkeling, but it's always been, like Huey said, in, in deeper water. So I know that one, um, and there's a couple of questions in here about experiments for children, things to do with children um, in the chat. Um, so one that... Um, David Alexander at the Environmental Center, the Essex Center, and I uh, always used to do is we made these little pond viewers. And um, if you take a coffee can and you cut off, you know, you drink the coffee, because I do that all the time, you cut off both ends of a metal coffee can. And then on one end, um, if you can get plexiglass, which is everywhere now, that's the best because it's very, very clear. Um, but you can use um, a clear plastic lid, anything that's like as clear as you can get it um, and put over glue onto one side so that you have, you know, a tube with a clear end on it um, and make sure it's really watertight. And then you kind of lay on your stomach next to a little pond and you put that pond viewer into the pond mm -hmm. um it kind of acts like goggles but you don't have to put your face under the water um and you can see you know if it's not a pond that gets stirred up a lot you can see like the tadpoles and um maybe some um dragonfly larva little fish whatever's swimming by um you know uh in in the little pond viewer um and that was always like a fun um camp activity uh, that we used to do with the kids. So, um, yeah, to Hugh's point, you can't really snorkel or scuba dive at many of our lakes, but, mm -hmm. um, but there are little pond viewers that you could do. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. And to just, um, go off of that, we had another comment in the chat from Beth April, which I think, you know, there's some watershed ambassadors in here. So I'm sure they were thinking along the same lines that, um, in addition to those keystone species that Elena spoke about, macroinvertebrates are also indicators of water quality. Um, so she had the adult dragonfly, but also that dragonfly nymph is a good indicator of water quality. The presence of stoneflies, mayflies, and other species indicate healthy streams. Um, and then a shout out to the Watershed Institute, which uh, does water quality monitoring, focusing on macroinvertebrates and what they can tell us about water quality. 
Um, so another way to involve kids, because in any any water bottle body, there's going to be some sort of macroinvertebrate life um, there, even if it's just midges and worms. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a nice idea, Beth. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, Mary says, our campers love pond viewers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, excellent. All right. Well, folks, um, Elena, if you don't have anything to, to add or any second thoughts that you had that you wanted to add in, or um, if there's something specific you would like um, folks to know about, if uh, there's any projects that um, you um, need volunteers for or that you know of? Um, I, will, I wanted to recommend this other book. I don't know if you guys uh, I think it's a good resource. Uh, so the name is Ecopsychology by Theodore Rose Sack. It's kind of hard to pronounce. Uh, maybe I'll put it in the chat as well. I just got the title there, Elena. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Theodore. Yes. Okay. Uh, it has some nice essays about like environmental topics. And uh, like I, th I think it's a good resource as well. Great. Um, Elena Angelica says, "I heard you are writing a book on the environment. Is it coming out soon?" Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's an illustrated book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I'm the co-author of this book, and so it will be coming out soon, maybe in the summer. So and where could we go, find that? Uh, I will write in my blog. I'll also put it in the chat. Yes, and, and let us know at Angie. We'll help you promote it when, uh, when it's out. That's oh, what we're here you. for, Elena. <laughs> okay, so that's the blog, Nurturing a Love for Nature, that will be the one. And they also put resources for educators too and other fun stuff. Excellent. Great. That is fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, yeah, big thank you, Elena, for your for sharing your knowledge and um, your love. We look we look forward to your book coming out. Now you should have led with that. This is your time to, <laughs> thank you. to pat yourself on the back um, and let everyone know. So it looks like um, if you want to learn more about Elena, connect with her, um, learn more about her work. She's got her um, her blog site in there. Um, and again, thank you to the Watershed Institute for sponsoring. Um, this session today, um, perfect sponsor for for this discussion, and um, yeah, I think we'll just we'll close it out. And uh, thank you so much again. Yeah, thank you everyone, and thank you guys for. <laughs> you can off mute and clap for Elena if you yeah. like. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Elena. Uh, thank you guys. You were great hosts. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>